Let's say I have two largish molecules. I don't know what these are. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are molecules of hexane. hexane. So I have two molecules of hexane. Hexane is a liquid at room temperature. Yeah, it is a liquid yeah. at room temperature um, and actually has a relatively high boiling point. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that it is a nonpolar. Uh, and one reason you know it's a nonpolar, by the way, if you stuck it in water, it will not mix. Mm -hmm. Water is polar. And that's something I think we'll talk about later, but I think you know this, most of you, that uh, polar dissolves polar and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, but they don't dissolve each other. But basically what's going on, because you have these random movement of electrons, you're going to have a, lots of different um, momentary dipoles. Right. And what's going to happen is you're going to have, instead of having one possible London force, you will have lots of London forces. And think of it this way, or here's a, a better picture. Uh, lots of London forces. Um, you ever played with a thread? Easy to break a thread? Yeah. Yeah, pretty easy. But what if you took 50 threads and twisted them together? Yeah. Easy to break? Not so much. Not so much anymore because it's now almost like a rope or whatever because, you know, you get tiny little strands. Each strand is very, very weak. Each strand, each London dispersion force from our original table has a strength of 0.1, but if you get 10 of them together, you get one. Yeah. If you get 100, you get 10. Yeah. If you get 1,000, you know, you get the idea. You know, for example, I'll bet you know that, say, wax, candle wax, um, is, uh, is a solid at room temperature. It is, and it's nonpolar. And it's, but it's nonpolar. If you dropped it in water, it would not dissolve. Um, but wax is just a very, very large molecule, and that molecule then um, sticks, to sticks together, and that's why it's a solid. So you can actually have solids that are London forces, but it has to do with the fact that you have large, large molecules. Okay? Good? All right. We should briefly talk about just the uh, noble gases. Yeah. And that we didn't really put them on the table, but mm -hmm. noble gases have very, very, very low boiling points. Can you make liquid noble gases? Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. Just get it down to Can me. you make solid noble gases? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, helium, the interesting one, of course, is his. Boiling point. No, this is his freezing, freezing point. point. His freezing point it's is almost negative. absolute zero. Yeah, so he's only got about three degrees where he's a solid, but you yeah. can make him a solid. Cool. So that's pretty cool. How does um, that work? How do they stick together? They stick together by London dispersion forces. Oh, because they're nonpolar. Because they're really nonpolar. Yeah, because so, it's just one atom. Yeah, it's just one atom trying to stick to another atom. So And they're you, really small. Well, actually, the helium is really small, but the yeah, xenon is really big. Compared, you know, it, helium is the smallest of all okay. atoms. Yeah, that's the heliums, the two heliums. And if I've got xenon, since the, he's got more electrons oh, moving around, some more London dispersion some forces. More London so forces. Higher so this way, xenon is minus one eleven, uh, which is still pretty cold, but is compared to helium, it's right. downright hot. Yep. Yeah. All right. I think we've already talked about that. Okay. Metallic bond. Hey, what's the key player? Um, is the, the electrons? Yep. Valence the electrons. valence electrons. By the way, have you realized there's kind of a pattern, ladies and gentlemen, that all bonding is a result of size, electrons. And electrons. It's electrons, yeah. It's electrons, and then the size makes a play role. Yep. Play role makes it work. Whatever. Defining private metals is the fact that you have um, is that metals conduct electrons. Oh yeah. And heat, by the way. Um, that and you know this. If you, uh, your mama probably told you this, do not stick a wire in the electrical socket. Or a fork. Or a fork. Why? Why would you not do that? Well, you can get a little bit of a shock. It would hurt. Yeah. 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 I did that one time. I was plugging in a lamp, and I had my fingers on the metal part of oh, the yeah. prongs. I was like, oh, I wonder what will happen. And I plugged it in, and I got a nice little shock right at my arm. It yeah. Was fun. Yeah. Getting shocks is not a fun thing. No. No, I've, I've done that plenty of times. Yeah. Yeah. That probably explains lots of problems. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, how, how does a metallic run? so awake in the Yeah. Woo -wee. Yeah. yeah. Man, too much playing around with electricity. All right. All right. Here's the deal. Um, I think my, it's hard to say, this says a C of roving valence electrons holds metals together. So here, let's take a look at this picture. Here, um, one thing that's also true about these electrons, since the electrons, these valence electrons, this is a, a bunch of metal atoms right here, okay, all hooked together. These electrons are free to move, and they just kind of randomly move from one atom to the next. It's kind of like a commune. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's true at a commune? A commune, people float around? No, they don't float around. They share. At least in theory, oh, okay. it's like utopia and all that stuff. I get it. You know, it, you're, it's not your stuff or my stuff; it's our stuff. Oh, okay. You see, I get it. So we all—it's all my stuff. I mean, it's not my stuff; it's all our stuff, right? And so these electrons, this electron does not belong to this atom; it belongs to all of the atoms. Oh, and so the electrons oh, kind of randomly yeah. move around. And if you get an area that has more electrons for just a 
Well, no, man. It's kind of like the community bikes you can just like pick up in Portland and go for a ride. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, Paris. I heard it's in yeah, Paris. You just grab too. a bike and you ride, and you leave it at the community bike spot, and you need another one, you grab a bike and you go for a ride again. Yeah, and so if if you get a bunch of bikes over on one side of the city, and let's say a bike is an electron, which has a negative charge, then that side of the city has a negative charge. Yeah. And when the bikes move to the other side of the city, probably because they commute back home or whatever, mm -hmm. then you see more. Negative on, on that side. side, but then it makes the other side positive. So you have like regions. So you'll have positive regions and uh, negative regions. Mm. And guess what? Positive things are still attracted to negative things. They are. It doesn't change, does it? Yeah. And since the electrons are free to move, that explains why it conducts electricity. Yes. So that's what's holding. So if you're if you're wearing a ring, so everybody who's watching this, if you get some kind of metal object around you, I want you to pick it up. All right, pick it up. So I have a metal object right here on my finger right here. This is my gold um, ring, my wedding ring. And um, this is being held together. I want you to envision, get your brain around it, mm. that this particular ring, there's electrons moving around, creating small little regions of positive and negative charge, which causes the gold to stick together. What are you doing? I'm trying to get my brain around it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's not working so well. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, you, you need, definitely need some help at this time of the morning. A little more coffee ought to do it. There we go. All right. So... And just an interesting thing about metals that I think it's interesting to talk about is there are um, there are uh, something called alloys, mm, mixtures of metals. And in the mixtures of metals, there's two varieties of mm -hmm. alloys. There are substitutional alloys, right. and there are interstitial alloys. Hey, Turns this out, looks like it might have to do with size. Yeah, it does. Mm. Uh huh. And actually, I almost need like a blank screen. I want to do something here. Oh, I want to hold on. I didn't do that right. So if I were to look at a metal atom. Uh, or, you know, a metal uh, set of molecules, what you would find is there would be holes in the molecule. Or it's not really a molecule. In the... In the There's a hole in, in the, the bucket. Metal. The metal, yeah. And the problem is, is that it would look kind of like this if you were to take a look. And in fact, actually, interesting thing, why are metals malleable, meaning bendable? Because there's holes? Because there's holes. Uh -huh. Because as you bend a metal, take a metal... And of course, you can bend a metal, right? Take like an aluminum pop can, right? And you can bend it, right? What Brush happens is hands. that the, because there are holes, if these molecules, as you bend uh, it in one they direction, they the slide holes. into the holes, Whoa. creating other holes, however. And so that's what's going on. But if you want to make a more rigid um, metal, fill you, the holes. you fill the holes. Cool. And those are called alloys. And there are two varieties of holes. And so if you look at this picture of a copper and zinc, put together make the, the uh, alloy brass. And so copper is the main one, but you see the holes are where these purples would have been. Does that mean the more holes it is, the more malleable it is? Yes, it does. So like lead would have lots of holes? Because it's very malleable. That is exactly oh, correct. You know, I learned something today. I was, I'm not sure I actually knew that. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So the substitutional <laughs> alloy, um, basically you fill the holes with zinc in this case, and you make the alloy called brass. Mm -hmm. And another one important one is steel. Carbonized all right? steel. And what they do is the, the fish thick, fills the tiny holes that exist. See, there's like a little the tiny hole. Yeah, in between. And there's a car, the interstitial alloy. I like that word. And that's, I love that word. And it's called steel. And they fill the tiny holes. And actually, they don't actually even use another metal. They use carbon. And it's pretty it's fascinating. Because it's tiny. I actually had an interesting experience. I got to see them making steel one day. I was down in Pueblo at a, it was a class I was taking. And we, they have a steel making factory in Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado, those of you who are outside of uh, Colorado. And, um, we were standing uh, 200 feet from this vat, and this vat, you know, was a huge vat filled with molten steel. They had electrolyzed it, put uh, electricity in it to melt it. That's how they got Whoa. it, and it was and it had this big old lid. And this 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 big thing is now probably um, two stories tall, and it's got a diameter of uh, 30 feet. It was absolutely huge, and we're like 100 feet away, and it is the hottest place you can imagine just standing 100 feet away at this balcony watching this occur. And this dude, okay, there's this building, all right, there's this building um, right next to this, or a, we're in a building, but there's a building in the building, if you will, or a little room. He comes out of the room, and he's wearing super heavy clothes and totally like in the winter. Reflective hot suit thing. Yeah, it's like yeah. a hot suit thing. And he just takes somebody and somebody else in the room, he um, takes um, and he opens this thing, this, this, the lid, electronically, I assume. And this guy takes this big old 50-pound bag, he throws it in there, and it catches on fire. Um, and then it just 
just ends in there. And what that was, our, our tour guide told us, basically this was the carbon. And actually they also used some molybdenum. And they add the carbon and the molybdenum to make the steel just the right strength. And there's somehow some kind of an auger down here that stirs it all up, mixes everything together. And then this thing, it was on... Um, uh, what's that auger made out of? I, I think <laughs> uh, ceramic, I would have to guess. And um, it's on this uh, conveyor belt. It's going on this conveyor belt. And eventually the... Um, the thing tips over, and then the, the metal pours out. They were making railroad rails, oh. and uh, and it was it went into this form, and then eventually, it w and the form was made of ceramic, which has even yeah. higher. That's ceramic is uh, has uh, is held together by network solids, so therefore it didn't melt the ceramic. Oh, and cool. eventually they cooled it, and we watched went to the cooling room, which was still very hot, and then eventually they took the rails and put them on the railroad. Uh, they actually put them on uh, trains. Okay. And then took them to wherever they needed to put them. Cool. I saw them making bathtubs on TV one time, and they had sand molds. They made molds out of sand, yeah. and then they poured the metal on top of that. That was kind of cool. Yeah.